Welcome, my friends, to the Bitcoin path. Today's guest is Tony, aka Vendetta. Together with him, we are gonna explore why it is so important to store your Bitcoin safely and how it can help you protect you from everything happening in the world. I enjoyed the conversation a lot and I hope you will too. Hello, uh, Tony. How are you? Very good, man. How are you? Uh, amazing. It's uh, I like doing this podcast. It's my, uh, my second one and uh, the first one was already really, really great. And I'm looking forward to the, the second episode. Excellent, man. Same here. Happy to be here. So... As a first starter, I always like to uh, start, uh, especially with Bitcoiners, why are they in Bitcoin? Like what, what brought them there? Why are they so passionate about it? What, what, what was the moment maybe? Uh, what was the aha moment for you? Why even bother with Bitcoin right now? Well, my aha moment, uh, unfortunately, came from a, from a place of pain. After having witnessed the complete obliteration of an entire country's life savings in uh in Lebanon three years ago. Um, when you see something, you know, that devastating, it's very hard to unsee it and not question what caused it. And that leads you very quickly down a rabbit hole um, to understanding, you know, that everything we've known about money since the beginning, since, since the day I was born, was a complete farce. It was a complete lie. It's a rig. It's a scam. It's a Ponzi scheme. You can call it whatever you like. It's complete rubbish. And uh, when you're born into a system like this, it's hard to imagine that it's not that because that's all you've ever known until it you know, becomes bad enough that you know, it, it completely starts falling apart and you become you know, the casualty of its destruction. And when you go through something like this, believe me, you will not go back to the very same source that put you in that position in the first place. So that's what brought me into Bitcoin. Thankfully, I found it. Because honestly, the way things are going uh, globally, if, if we didn't have anything like Bitcoin, um, we're, we're headed for a very dire future. So um, I'm very optimistic and thankful that we do have this, this option, this exit, this insurance, you can call it whatever you like. But it is the light, it is the hope that will preserve um, you know, every individual's values, dignity, honor, and more importantly, their freedom. Because it's the one asset that you can finally own that no one, no matter what they, what they want, will be able to take away from you. Uh, great. And d did you live at uh, the time in Lebanon or had you any connection with it? Or No, I did not live in Lebanon, but I have a lot of friends and very close uh, people to me that live there that have to this day still not come out of the disaster that they've been put in. Um, you have to understand, oh. I mean, these are folks that, you know, have been working hard their entire lives with all their life savings in a bank account, you know, as they've been told is the way to go. And then from one day to the next, they woke up with absolutely nothing. Can you maybe quickly uh, give for those who don't know what happened there exactly, give a summarization, what happened there, why caused uh, why was it caused? What it happened? Like a quick overview. Yeah, of course. I mean, for the longest time, Lebanon's banking system was touted as you know the golden one of the golden examples to follow. You know, they had an extremely strong, uh, robust financial system. The banks were uh, you know were, were running you know like like champs. And the the biggest perk about them, which in hindsight now was the biggest red flag, is that they were offering very high interest rates on your deposits. So if you had a significant amount of life savings and you just left them in a bank account, you'd be making anywhere between 7% up to 20%, depending on the currency you had it in, just by leaving it in a bank account. And that's what a lot of people were doing because essentially at, you know, at, that, at those numbers, you're living for free. So if, you've, if you're a high net worth individual, let's say you have a million dollars, you're making you know, 7 to 20% a year. Well, you know, you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy living. And so... Many folks, you know, fell into that trap, into thinking, you know, that, you know, they're going to live like kings without any effort, but very quickly realized that the only way to fund this Ponzi was from new people coming in, being attracted into these interest rates. And then eventually at one point, you know, the money dried up. And when the money dried up, well, how are you going to pay these interest rates? You can't. 
And this is where the cracks start to happen. And, you know, one thing leads to another. And before you know it, it gets bad enough and boom. You wake up one day, credit cards no longer work. You try to call the bank to find out, you know, what the hell happened. There's no answer at the bank. And, you know, a few, a few days after that, you realize that, you know, there's no access to your funds. You're not allowed to withdraw your funds. They're essentially gone, you know, seized, seized by the bank for whatever bullshit reason that they give you. And uh, this is what happens. So whether you're worth a dollar or a billion dollars, the next day when this, when this played out, you were worth zero. A fascinating story. Um, maybe to take a step back to you again, um, just to make sure uh, everybody knows you, what, uh, what was your background? Uh, where did you come from? I think you were in cybersecurity before. Are you still in there? And yes. what was your road before Bitcoin, before you discovered it? Yes, absolutely. I come from about 25 years of cybersecurity, encryption and privacy. And I've been in Bitcoin for, uh, say, a little over six years now. And uh, I bring a lot of that knowledge, you know, into the Bitcoin, into the Bitcoin space, specifically with regards to the consults that we do at the Bitcoin way. You know, our mission there is to fast track the onboarding of as many folks as possible into proper Bitcoin self-custody. And we do it, you know, by applying a lot of valuable, you know, best tips and practices from the cybersecurity world into the Bitcoin self-custody space. And that, that would be maybe uh, the best part to, 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 uh, to get it hooked now. Um, how do you, like when we established, okay, why is Bitcoin important? The fiat system is collapsing. We have uh, a savings technology where we can finally still uh, trust in and save our financial energy in. And when we, when we have this in Bitcoin, when we understand why, the, the second question is uh, always, how do I do it? What's self-custody? Um, what is, like, how do I manage my keys? What uh, hardware wallets can I use? Like, for a complete newbie, maybe, for someone that does not know anything about Bitcoin privacy, that doesn't know anything about Bitcoin self-custody, where do they start? How can you ensure an easy setup and where you can start for someone that is uh, not really deep into it? What would you recommend for them? Yeah, I mean, the, the start of this journey always begins with a conversation. We, you know, we offer a free 30-minute call to anyone that wants to you know, chime in and inquire and ask all questions. We like to begin the journey by making sure that you know, there's a proper understanding around Bitcoin, what it is, what it represents, why it's so important, why it's so crucial that uh, you know, your people embrace it and adopt it as fast as possible. And once you know, that foundation is, is put into place, then the way we make the journey easy is by handling all the technical aspects around Bitcoin. Uh, most folks, you know, they, uh, they're petrified about you know, doing anything that potentially risks losing their funds. Because although most people want to get into Bitcoin, a lot of them are not te technically savvy, and that scares them. So we remove that anxiety by hand-holding, you know, individuals through the entire process. Like we will guide you through all of it, you know, specifically by telling you, all right, you press here, you do this, you check this, you uncheck that. And within a very quick period of time, you go from nothing to being completely bulletproof and airtight in every phase of that journey. So the first, the first step of the way begins usually with a, with a the hardware signing device. We ensure that you use a proper device. We, base, we make recommendations based on open source or verifiable source gear that we have tested ourselves. Um, we only recommend uh, hardware and software that uh, strictly adheres to the Bitcoin ethos or the Bitcoin white paper. What that means is that any closed source project, we immediately disqualify any project that uh, does censorship on any level or collaborates with chain analysis on any level, we automatically disqualify. We don't take any shortcuts here. And that applies to the cold wallet, to the node, to anything, you know, that has, that's going to get involved in your Bitcoin, Bitcoin self-custody um, package. And where does uh, privacy and non, no KVC play a role in that? Like how important is it to uh, buy your 
Bitcoin at a place where you cannot be tracked or does it not matter? Like, should you go with a centralized exchange where you identify yourself, where you have a light KYC or um, how can you do it with no KYC? Um, like, how, where's, the, where's the steps here? Well, there, there needs to be a fundamental understanding of what privacy is and why it really matters. You know, uh, these days, most people don't even think about it twice. They don't care. You know, they're just very nonchalant about it. And it's a very big problem um, because we've never really had anything at, like Bitcoin before. Okay, like something so finite in supply and so incredibly valuable because of its scarcity. It, it's not immediately available today, perhaps, but once the world understands this, the panic and FOMO and the money that's going to come into the Bitcoin space is going to send its value to parabolic levels we've never seen before. Um, so the, the dangers of KYC is that they've, it's been sold as this thing to protect the consumer, to protect you from losing your money, where in fact, the, the truth about KYC is anything but the protection of a consumer. KYC is, was put in place for 100% control and surveillance of funds so that uh, a small percentage of individuals who, uh, who want to play God will be able to surveil and control anything and everything you do with your money. That's the, co that's the, that's the reason for KYC. All right? And the problem with it with an asset like Bitcoin is that if a centralized institution gets hacked and whoever hacked it gets access to a database with a name of list of everyone that's holding Bitcoin, well, then these people have a, have a big problem potentially on their hands because as the value of Bitcoin continues to rise, you know, the attempts to steal it and go after it are going to rise along with it. So if your name is on a list, how do you deal with it if somebody targets you knowing that you have your Bitcoin? This is where privacy comes in. And there are tools that you can use to protect yourself, protect your forward privacy. Now, these are advanced tools that are part of the Bitcoin ecosystem. You know, a very popular one is known as a coin joint, where uh, it breaks the heuristics between your Bitcoin that you've purchased via KYC and gives you forward privacy from that point on. So it's essentially like taking cash out of a bank ATM. The bank knows you took out whatever you took out, but has no clue what you did with it afterwards. CoinJoin does essentially the exact same thing to your Bitcoin. And a lot of folks are you know, getting involved in it. And it's important that they do if they care about their privacy. Now, KYC is popular because it's convenient. And most folks you know, tend to opt for the, 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 shortest, the shortest way, the laziest way, without really thinking twice about it. And that's because they don't put much value onto why the privacy is important and why not like going, not going the no KYC route could potentially backfire. And so we provide the information for both the pros and cons for both the KYC approach and also the no KYC approach. And those that are not familiar with the peer to peer buying a Bitcoin, we show them how to do it. Um, we're not a financial institution ourselves, so we don't sell or buy any Bitcoin. Okay. So we are just a consulting service that essentially educates folks on what's out there and how to properly use it. Oh, that's amazing. So um, for people that already have a lot of Bitcoin, you are saying they should uh, coin join or use some privacy tools to um, ensure that even if they are on a list, they have the right uh, security level. And for people that want to buy Bitcoin um, now or like in the future and the uh, the coming Bitcoin they are buying, they should actually uh, buy it no KYC on um, light KYC, especially no KYC peer to peer, I guess. Yeah, well, anyone that values their privacy and wants to protect it, you know, there are options available to them. That's essentially what we present. We don't necessarily tell anyone you have to do this. We, we present them with the options that are available and you know what are the benefits of each. And depending on each individual's um, preferences and, you know, their objectives, they will either um, opt into one of, one of them or they won't. Some folks, you know, they have their KYC and they leave it as such and they're fine. So, and other folks don't want to take that risk because they, 
they've done the work into understanding the risks you know that come along with it they understand privacy they value privacy and they take the proper measures to ensure it as much as possible when you're interacting peer to peer you're the you know there's no uh, there's there's no giving up any identification or any paperwork or any questions for that matter you're dealing with you know an anonymous individual somewhere around the globe you know that's willing to sell or buy bitcoin from you you know, via via secure peer to peer transaction. That's how it's done. Are there additional risks of buying Bitcoin KYC other than staying on a list and being a potential target, like uh, on a state level? Maybe is there like you you are on a list and people when the, the centralized exchange gets hacked, you can be seen how many Bitcoin you have. Uh, This actually happened to myself already uh, on on one specific hack. Um, fortunately, it was a long time ago, and it, it was uh, only a small amount of of of, uh, of, of my Bitcoin. So uh, I experienced that myself, but I did not lose the Bitcoin, uh, and uh, I did not have any other inconvenience to it other than staying on that public list that everybody can see that I have that much Bitcoin. And especially when we consider that Bitcoin might be going parabolic in the next five to 10 years, uh, this could be a big amount and could could take a big uh, target on your back. But other than that, are there additional risks to it, to a KYC exchange? Um, well, if you leave your coins on an exchange, yes, there's absolutely a risk that you lose them. If the exchange goes bust or decides one day not to give it to you for whatever reason, well, then, yeah, you have a the, uh, have a big risk of losing your funds. This is why even if you were to buy your Bitcoin from a centralized institution, as soon as you buy it, the, the right action is to withdraw it instantly to proper self-custody so that it's in your possession. So... Yeah, I mean, other than that, no, I don't see any other risk other than, you know, the, the, the database being hacked and your name is on a list or you forgetting or you're just being lazy and leaving your coins on an exchange for convenience and then you're know, waking up one day and it's gone. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, not your keys, not your coins is a principle in, in Bitcoin that if you are in for a while, you should get it like most. I see actually people that have a hundred percent in bitcoin uh and leave it on exchange uh that are not that savvy in bitcoin and i always tell them don't do that uh these are the reasons and maybe when maybe when you would summarize what are the main reasons for not doing that uh like the, the main reason for me would also be when the centralized exchange go bust your your coins are also gone like this is for me always the main reason but what are other reasons to do not leave your coins and in exchange for newer people especially well i mean if you leave your coins on an exchange it's essentially like leaving your money in a bank it does not belong to you a lot of people to this day still don't don't know or understand this that the money in your bank account is not yours it lit it legally belongs to the bank and they technically owe you that money back But if they don't want to give it to you for whatever reason, they don't have to. And there's nothing you can do about it. And it's the same, the same concept applies to leaving your coins on an exchange. You do not control it. See, it comes down at the end of the day, it always comes down to you know, owning your keys. It's about control. With regards to your money, if it's not in your control, it is 100% not yours, regardless of the amount, regardless of whether you think you're dealing with a reputable institution. It doesn't matter. When things go bad, the most reputable of places do bad things and have to, uh, you know, have to play along by the rules from the same folks that designed the system to steal from you. So reputation doesn't matter. At the end of the day, they all follow the same rules. And in order to avoid being a casualty of war is to assume responsibility over your money and before bitcoin this was impossible okay because the fiat system is owned by you know it's owned by government it's owned by the state you don't own anything so unless you're part of their club you're you know just a, a pawn in the system and you have to follow the rules that are obviously designed against you you know like whoever beats the casino nobody beats the casino 
the same concept. Yeah. Where, where do you see um, mass adoption for uh, taking self custody? Uh, mm -hmm. And in the future, like now we are a small space still. Uh, we are really early on into Bitcoin. And even those people that are in Bitcoin, not everybody does self-custody and all the privacy tools uh, we have in our hands right now. How do you see uh, Bitcoin adoption when we are, let's see, at 20, 30, 50% of people having Bitcoin? How can we have them un to understand that if you leave your Bitcoin on a centralized exchange, it's basically like having gold at the bank or having your money in the bank. It does not belong to look like, uh, where do you see the mass adoption going? Do we have one day every, every person has their own keys and manage their own keys and self custody is a normal thing, like having your own uh, Twitter account or Is it still something only a small group of people will do even in 20, 30 years? Where do you see the learning curves for the mass going in that direction? Yeah, I mean, at some point, having self-custody is definitely going to be the norm, in my opinion. I don't see it happening any other way. Now, how do we get you know, from where we are now to that point in time? My view is a little bit harsh on this because I genuinely believe that most people are going to get completely destroyed before they actually learn that they, uh, they need to change their habits, that they need to unlearn, you know, the lies that you know, they've been told and relearn, you know, the, the proper ways. Until someone's directly hit, until they feel the burn, they feel the pain, most folks, you know, will just go along living their comfortable lives. Unfortunately, that, com that comfort is coming to an end, regardless of where you live. I mean, if it's not immediately apparent in what's going on globally, whether with, whether with you know, illegal mandates or having your freedoms and, and uh, more restrictions on anything you, you do, whether your bank is coercing you, whether your bank is asking you for 100 questions, locking up your, your accounts, forbidding you from sending money from point A to point B without asking you a thousand questions. All of these things are going to get you know, gradually worse and worse and worse because the system is falling apart They realize that there's more folks exiting the system and they're desperately trying to close um, all the ways that you know, folks can do this in order to somehow remain relevant. I think these efforts will go nowhere, but in the meantime, they will make your life a living hell if you're not, um, if you're not careful. And so the time to get out of the system is running out. Um, And if you're going to do it, you're better off doing it now before you get completely wrecked with what's coming. I don't believe there's any city or any country that's safe from the collapse of fiat currencies. Some folks argue that this stuff only happens to these other places. That's an arrogant and a very delusional and a very dangerous mindset to hide, to hide behind. People with a lot of money, rich folks, need Bitcoin more than anything else because It is the only way that they're going to preserve their wealth. If you think you have $100 billion dollars and like you're, you're living like a king and you're untouchable, when, when, you know, when that dollar becomes worth nothing, well, then you're worth nothing along with it. So what do you do? Where are you going to save it? You're going to save it in gold? You're going to save it in real estate? Where are you going to save it? These traditionally um, safe havens that people thought you know, were like the best place to, to put their money are nothing of the sort. Gold is heavily manipulated. And if... You know, if everybody decides to go on to gold, they'll dig up the entire planet and then the supply of gold all of a sudden goes from where it is now to some exponentially higher level. You know, real, real estate, do you really own your property if you're paying taxes on it every year? You know, or paying all sorts of like uh, uh, not, nonsense license or things that are invented, you know, uh, every, every here and then, you know, for you to pay? Is it actually your property? It's not your property. So unless you have an army to protect it, and by that, when I say protection, I mean... Use violence if necessary, because, you know, fundamentally, that's the only way people have been able to protect their, their assets, uh, you know, over the history of time is through violence. You're not going to you're not going to um, talk your way out of a gunfight. So that's one thing. So Bitcoin is the only asset that we've ever known in the history of humanity that you can literally memorize 12 or 24 words in your head, pick it anywhere you want. Nobody, nobody can take it away from you. 
Nobody can censor you. Nobody can sanction you. Nobody can weaponize the money against you. Nobody can take it away from you. It is 100% yours. And there's more folks around the globe that have been traditionally locked out of the banking system that have been living under the worst conditions financially for decades. All of a sudden now, they have a bank account. No, not a bank account. They have savings. They have money. They can transact. They don't need somebody's permission to, uh, to you know, send f- money from point A to point B. They are doing it on their own. And nothing is going to get these folks to adopt anything else but freedom money, Bitcoin. And so when this pain arrives to more places around the globe and comfortable people all of a sudden become uncomfortable, that's when you see, you know, the, 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 the chaos break out and, you know, the, uh, the acceleration to find the solution. And the only solution that will you know, eventually make sense is Bitcoin, because it will be finally understood that once you own it, it is yours. Unless you screw up and be, be lazy with your self-custody and don't take the proper measures to protect your generational wealth, no one else is going to take it from you. So when we have now uh, a world where everybody is self custody is on self custody everybody everybody has bitcoin bitcoin is the um the main major apex asset everybody is on and we are also thinking about bitcoin in a unit unit of account like it's completely in the world fixated fiat is not there anymore will at this point bitcoin have broken the state monopoly? Is that something on uh, the state monopoly on violence? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, on, a, on a Bitcoin standard where you cannot infinitely print the money, uh, violence ends almost instantly. How are you going to pay for wars? There's only 21 million finite supply of Bitcoin. I, I am assuming like maybe like 5 million of them are, com- are lost already. Nobody knows where they are. So technically... We're dealing with, what, 16, 17 million? Most of them are privately owned by folks that want nothing to do with the fiat system or violence or wars or any of that corruption. They're not giving up their coins for anyone. So if you want to fund something as retarded as a war on a Bitcoin standard, you can't. Unless somehow you convince folks to give you their, their coins. Yeah, good luck with that. So Bitcoin forces humanity to become better, okay? Because the, the only way you're going to be able to earn Bitcoin is to provide good value, high value into the world. So it's going to force every one of us to level up their skill set in order to survive. I mean, if I'm going to provide a service, that service needs to be of value to someone so that you know, they're willing to pay me for it. And, you know, the, the accepted payments at that point in time will be in Satoshis. I mean, the days of talking about Bitcoin, like we talk about it today, um, I think will be gone <laughs> because, you know, uh, no one will be able to own a whole coin in the very, very near future. Uh, the, the world will standardize on like Satoshis will become, you know, the, the terminology used, um, not Bitcoin. Have, finding a, a whole coiner, oh, my God, it's going to be like, you know, uh, finding, you know, like a, like a unicorn. So um, Bitcoin forces the world to progress in a very, very positive way. You know, that's why they sent some folks called Renaissance 2.0. And I believe this because everything, everything will improve. Uh, Prices will go down. Um, People will have better lives. Your quality of life will go up. And you don't have to worry about, uh, about coercion in the financial sense. You don't have to worry about being, having your funds blocked or seized because somebody doesn't like your opinion you know like all of that nonsense gets completely terminated and that's how it should be do you have a time frame for that like i think it's a really hard thing Mm. to do Uh, but but is it like uh, do you see fear dying in the next 10 years in the next 100 years um the last guest i know said uh he will he does not see fiat surviving the next 30 years um what is your thoughts on that listen i wish i had a crystal ball if it was up to me i'd end it 10 years ago you know but uh <laughs> that's <laughs> that, that that's not that's not how how it works unfortunately um i think 
Fiat's going to be around for a while. Um, but I think the acceleration out of fiat is going to happen. Um, and fortunately, we don't need 100% Bitcoin adoption for fiat to fall apart. Um, you need way, way less than that. You know, I mean, I'd say, I don't know, maybe like 10% Bitcoin adoption. And you already start seeing like a massive shift in, in human behavior um, and the way you know, folks start interacting with each other, you know, when they realize that, you know, the money that you have in the bank account now is worthless when it costs you like $150 to buy a chicken breast, you know, well, you know, why would you start, why would you, you know, why would you provide your services, your time and value for that worthless toilet paper? You know, you'd want something else, right? Something that actually keeps its value and appreciates over time. And this is where, um, those that you know don't understand this now are going to follow those that are leading by example so everyone that's in bitcoin especially those that are already living on a bitcoin standard because they're somehow they've somehow managed to create you know very nice circul circular economies for themselves where they're completely self sufficient amongst themselves on a bitcoin standard you know that's going to start to become more and more uh, prevalent you're going to start seeing it in more places and, you know, folks that are not on it are going to start paying attention because all of a sudden, you know, these guys are still living well while your life on a fiat standard is, you know, continuously getting worse. And so at some point, even the most stubborn human being is going to say enough is enough and, you know, ask, how do I get out of this rut? Some folks may not. Some folks are happy living, you know, like, uh, you know, under somebody else's foot. That's fine. But as long as it's their option. But I suspect that a lot more individuals will not want to live like government donkeys. They're going to want, they value their freedom, and they're going to want to live the way they see fit, not the way somebody else decides that they should live their life. I think that's a really, really great point uh, to to the end, the, to go to the end of the, the podcast. I loved what you said here. Um, I... So for, like to the one to the other point, I loved especially the the part where um we have to provide value to get anything in return. Right now in the fiat world, it's possible to have rent seekers. Like it's possible to when you have a lot of wealth, you get wealthier over time. But with a proof of work system, you have to provide value for others to get anything done. Like that's also the the um, difference between any altcoins that are on a proof of stake model uh, the more you stake the more wealthy you are the more you get in return that's uh, that's a broken system in itself i think and the proof of work system is just so 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 great because if you offer a lot of value you will get a lot of bitcoin in return but if you stop offering value you will not get any bitcoin more and the only thing getting more is the, the value of your bitcoin but in the bitcoin world it's more like everything gets cheaper but your bitcoin stack will not increase if you don't offer value to the society uh, th this uh this um part i love the most about bitcoin yeah absolutely and i mean at, at some point in the very very near future um in my opinion you won't be we won't be able to buy bitcoin anymore i mean uh, once this the etfs get approved okay i suspect all that big money is going to want to siphon everything that's currently available to them, right? And once that happens, you know, that's when you go to bed one night and the price is, I don't know, 37,000 and you wake up the next day and you, you give yourself a heart attack because <laughs> you're like, well, what, what happened? What, what happened overnight? And essentially, you know, when the supply on the market is gone because somebody else owns it now, this is what happens. You know, when, when you have a, there's no limit to the demand shock on Bitcoin, but nothing anyone can do is going to change the supply. And that's the key. So there can be 8 billion people demanding Bitcoin. The supply remains at wherever it's at, 21 million minus whatever has been lost forever. No matter who likes it or not, it's that simple. Maybe one last question. What do you think about the spot ETF that's possibly uh, granted in the next one to six months? What I hear about in America, or what are your thoughts about what happens when it once it gets approved? Uh, when will it get approved? What what's your thoughts on this whole topic? 
Well, the, the Bitcoin ETF is definitely a bullish news for Bitcoin in the sense that it's going to finally give the courage to a lot of folks to, uh, to consider it. Not because the ETF itself is such a good product. It's not. It's, it's paper Bitcoin. You don't, you don't own any Bitcoin if you buy a Bitcoin ETF. But a lot of folks that don't want to have anything to do with Bitcoin for whatever absurd reason currently, um, all of a sudden now they're like, oh, wow, okay. So now BlackRock says it's, it's okay. So then, you know, let's look into it. So it brings, the, it brings like a, a monumental shift of attention, you know, from folks that have a lot of money but I've never considered it before. Now, now they'll start paying serious attention to it. And hopefully, you know, with, with time, they will, you know, invest the, the, uh, the energy to actually learn what it is and uh, opt out of the ETF and perhaps into self-custody. And that'll continue to, you know, to increase over time. When the big institutions come in, like, you know, why, why they're all fighting for it now is because they realize that globally, there's probably less than 2 million Bitcoin on all exchanges today. The value of all that Bitcoin, if you look at today's price, is maybe, like if my math is on, maybe like, I don't know, 70, 75 billion dollars. All right. For an asset manager of 10 trillion, what do you think 75 billion is? It's, it's, it's like 75 cents in your pocket. It's nothing. So they could literally swipe it all out in one go, whether it's one of them, whether it's all of them. Essentially, it'll be gone because it's, peanuts for someone with that much capital and that's when you know the price goes parabolic and that's when everybody else you know the general public you know wake up one day and they read the headlines that bitcoin is half a million or one million or some ridiculous number like this now all of a sudden they all want it but by then you know the most folks are completely priced out of it and they, they will not be able to get anywhere near what they can today or for the last 15 years, had they been paying proper attention and not laughing it off as some, some silly scam. This is what I think is going to happen. So it's definitely good news. It's definitely bullish news to create uh, as, you know, much more attention and awareness um, towards the asset. The product itself, I would never buy. You know, you're not buying real Bitcoin on buying Bitcoin ETF. Any profits you make are in fiat. So... Um, but again, you know, everybody needs to start somewhere. And as they say, you know, you, you get Bitcoin at the price you deserve. So if you wait too long until it becomes super, super safe and you're super, super comfortable that all your neighbors talk about it, well, then you're going to pay a very, very expensive price, you know, for that comfort and safety. Whereas if you do the homework now, do the work, do the research, spend some time learning, listening, asking questions and digging a little deeper, you know, you will get in on an opportunity that humanity has never ever seen before and will likely never ever see again that's my opinion on bitcoin it's it will it's bigger than electricity and the internet combined exponentially that's the way i see it that's a great uh last line i love it um i have an end routine at the the podcast where the previous guests ask a question for the next guest without knowing who's the next guest and the previous guest uh, asked uh, you um, what core principle is most important to you in your life dignity dignity and 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 freedom um, no one should live a life um, dictated by someone else no one should do it if you have any sense of self-value and, and, and dignity, this is something you will insanely defend and, not, and, like, and resist any attempts to take it away from you, no matter what. You know, there's a famous saying that goes along the lines of, you cannot call yourself peaceful if you're not capable of violence. If you're not capable of violence, you're not peaceful. You're harmless. You're useless. That's so great. Yeah, if, you, if you're not capable of violence, uh, you don't know if you're peaceful. Yes, that's great because you're, because you're harmless. You cannot well, call yourself peaceful if you're not willing to defend your freedom using violence. You know, the most, the most peaceful times in the world have usually come after wars when people, you know, unfortunately had to die 
to protect these uh, these values and these principles. I mean, the fact that you know we've been living free for so long, this doesn't just land from the sky. You know, many individuals sacrificed their lives for this, and it's important to keep that in mind because see, history seems to be repeating itself now, and uh, you know we're put in a position now where either we fight to preserve freedom or you live like a slave it's not a movie anymore this is this is reality great wow um tony i loved uh, the interview with you um i will probably ask you in some uh, routine again to let's do it again to have a con continuation i uh, loved what you're saying i also loved what uh, what are you doing uh, with the bitcoin way And maybe if you want, you can have a, uh, you can uh, shout out the Bitcoin way. You can point people where they should go uh, to your profile, to the Bitcoin way. Where should they go when they uh, want to learn more about you, about the Bitcoin way? Yeah, sure. I mean, you can, we're both very active on, on social media. You can follow me directly at V4BTC on Twitter. Likewise, for the Bitcoin Way account, which is the Bitcoin Way underscore, obviously the website, the BitcoinWay.com. Um, like I said, we offer a free 30-minute um, call to anyone that wants just to chime in to find out more um, so we can get to know one another. There's no commitment. There's no obligation whatsoever. It's really just a, just a, a casual conversation. And um, our mission is to handhold everyone you know, into proper Bitcoin self-custody and we'll remove all the technical hurdles. So you don't have to worry about any of this. The entire process is streamlined. It's fun. Um, and there are no stupid questions at the, at the Bitcoin way. So everybody's welcome. And I look forward to talking to everyone. I think that's very uh, important for hyper-bit conversation to offer services that uh, handhold the people uh, into self-custody into full privacy also yeah great talking to you with, uh, with you tony and uh i see you in the next one thank you so much for having me